morning, um, everybody here uh, who is with us now in this uh, panel discussion. Uh, my name is Ingrid Klingmann. I am um, the chairperson of EFGCP, the European Forum for Good Clinical Practice. That is a not-for-profit organization in Brussels that uh, brings together um, multi-stakeholder audience um, from industry, from um, ethics committees, competent authorities, patient organizations, other stakeholders um, in the medicines development process to proactively uh, and jointly um, discuss problems and find solutions as far as possible. It's my big pleasure to, um, to welcome my panelists here, uh, who are going to the colleagues who are going to join me uh, in this uh, discussion about healthcare data privacy and ownership. Um, this is something that is uh, very core to our activities in EFGCP because where science and ethics meet is uh, and technic meet, technical aspects and quality meet, that is where the, the, the need for discussion and joint solutions is found. So I have with me uh, Nenad Georgiev uh, from the uh, University of Leuven, here, also here in Belgium, then Hernando Geraldo from Böhringer Ingelheim. Um, Catherine Konaki um, from um, um, HL7 and Anka Petre from 23 Consulting. And all my colleagues will present themselves and also um, yeah, help starting the discussions here by giving two points that uh, they find particularly relevant when we talk about healthcare privacy uh, and uh, ownership. And in relation with blockchain, because that is our main topic today and the background for our discussions here. So may I start with Catherine? Well, welcome. Absolutely, hi. Uh, I'm Catherine Kronaki. I'm the Secretary General of the HL7 uh, Europe uh, Foundation in Brussels. And I'm also honored to be the president of the European uh, Federation for Medical Informatics. So in this uh, dual role, the topic of our panel today, privacy and ownership of health data, is extremely important. And uh, we have done a lot of work to promote the adoption of standards for interoperability, safety and trust uh, among people that are participating in clinical trials. And, and, and this is uh, the keystone of the new society that is coming up, which is extremely data driven and where data literacy comes to play a major role, probably more important than, than digital literacy itself. The two points that I would like to highlight is that we need to pay more attention to um, data provenance and data quality uh, moving into the future. And uh, in that context, uh, standardization is uh, elemental. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, Anka, would you like to follow? Sure. Uh, well, I'm very happy to be here once again at the European Blockchain Convention. Um, I am a pharmacist by training and I'm the founder of 23 Consulting, which is a Paris-based company that is specialized in supporting healthcare organizations in their blockchain projects. Uh, I also wear a couple of different hats in this industry. Um, I help uh, run and manage the Healthcare Data Institute, which is a, a French, but also European uh, think tank uh, dedicated to healthcare data. And I'm also right now writing a book about the value of health data for patients. So the way I look at data ownership is a lot from the patient perspective and how can blockchain help empower patients to have more control, if not ownership of their data. Very good, thank you very much. Hernando, would you go next? You are on mute. <laughs> I am Hernando Geraldo, I'm from Beringer Ingelheim. Uh, at Beringer, I play a, a bunch of different leadership roles uh, within the clinical operations side. I'm also engaged in a lot of innovations in digital outside the company. Um, that brings me to Pharma Ledger, where I'm the, the uh, point of contact and lead for one of our use cases. Um, and and I think it's important for me to, to, to also share with you that um, this is not uh, my career choice. I did not wind up in pharma. I did 25, 20, 25 years of business outside of pharma. So I come in with a unique set of perspectives and eyes to the work that we do, which I think is, is really interesting. I think what's important for me is, is uh, patient's ability to connect with their own data, but also to understand um, the, the, the connectivity to these processes that seem sometimes a little bit um, 
medical and also distant. So for me, it's important for them to understand how we're using their data and, and that their data is safe. Okay, very good. Yeah, we have already a, a range of, of perspectives that we are going to cover. So last but not least, Nenat, uh, I have you last because we are most frequently in uh, contact. So I know that you don't uh, mind that you are last here. Not at all. Thank, thanks a lot, Ingrid. Uh, it's truly a pleasure and honor to be here today among, among all of you. Uh, my name is Nenat Gurgiev. I'm a privacy lawyer by training um, and currently working as a researcher um, in law at the KU Leuven Center for IT and IP Law in Belgium. And I'm also a co-lead of the regulatory, legal and data protection framework for, uh, for the Pharma Ledger project. And um, I've been closely involved uh, with blockchain for quite some time now. Um, I guess I'm one of, the, one of the many who got caught up in the hype a few years back. Uh, but I'm extremely happy to see uh, that there is increased interest in the technology because there's, there's a lot of potential if designed properly. Um, and adopted where appropriate, of course. And, and my work uh, with blockchain has obviously revolved around the, the data protection and privacy aspects. Um, as I would say, I've become quite early and conscious uh, of, of the internet monopoly that has influenced sort of um, how services are delivered online and the negative impacts that, um, uh, and challenges of, of such centralized networks from a security and privacy perspective. So, so I got interested in, um, in how we can move away from heading towards a future of, um, I would say, vertically integrated silos of data controlled by a few large players um, where our personal data are used um, sometimes to, to manipulate or influence our, our online behavior. Um, so if I were to summarize my main interest with um, uh, in working with blockchain, it is around this idea that each one of us uh, needs a self-sovereign digital identity uh, that is not dependable on, on any central authority. And until blockchain, we didn't uh, we didn't have a technical groundwork um, to assert our sovereignty. Okay, very good. Yeah, um, you all have heard um, the introduction into blockchain. This is, um, you see also behind Nenat, our logo. Um, this is um, the, the topic that brings us all together um, because, um, yeah, there is obviously a big need to uh, make here a real progress in creating also the infrastructure, not only the technology, to be able to utilize this um, novel approach to, or perhaps it's not so novel anymore, but for us in healthcare, it is quite novel because we have not really uh, used it in, uh, to its full potential. Um, but because um, the healthcare environment and also the, the development uh, environment for new treatments, whether this is now drugs or devices, um, is particular sensitive because um, what we try to achieve here is we want to uh, generate reliable information um, for the uh, yeah for the development of new treatments for patients. That is the ultimate goal. And for that, we need to enroll uh, patients, human beings into a test situation. Um, this is approximately the worst thing that somebody can do. Uh, and it went also horribly wrong in the past, as you all know, when you think about the Third Reich and Nazi crimes. So we are all extremely sensitive uh, to make sure that whatever we do with patients uh, in such a test situation is really done in a in not only an acceptable, but in a perfectly acceptable way, uh, acceptable uh, taking into consideration the, the dignity and the self-responsibility and the right uh, to self-responsibility for all patients under all circumstances and in all conditions. Um, we had a lot of discussions about the role of data in that. Of course, ultimately, we are generating data. We are in need of data. We have, meanwhile, also worked on, on exploiting other available healthcare data in a more yeah, intelligent way so that we perhaps can, uh, over time, reduce the number of patients that we have to expose to a test situation. But that comes at the price that we need to define what data we can really um, utilize and under what conditions. And I think that is where we have most of the, the discussions also with patients and patient representatives. Yes, we want to have new treatments. Yes, we need to make sure that the date, the treatment uh, are reliable, treatments are reliable. That means we need to be sure that the data are reliable. And yes, we do not want to be exposed to research as much as possible. On the other hand, if data are required, we need to make sure that the data that, that can be used for that 
are reliable and are also of good quality. On the other hand, we need to make sure that we protect our privacy and our confidential and, and maintain the confidentiality of our health condition, which is jeopardized, otherwise we would not be patient. So we have here a really vulnerable point uh, in our life. So we need to make sure that we find a good balance between providing the data that are required, generating the data that are required, but really doing this under full protection of what is important for me personally as an individual. So this balance, uh, benefit risk balance between rights of the individual and the rights of the and, and needs of the, the society or other patients at large, that is the underlying um, yeah, conflict that we have to deal with and where um, it is extremely important that we create now also for blockchain an environment, um, a governance infrastructure combined with the technical and ethical aspects uh, that can do this in an optimal way. And uh, this Pharma Ledger project, and that was the reason why we in EFGCP were so keen to join and happy when we were invited to join, is to, to contribute the viewpoints and the opinions uh, from the ethical side and the scientific side and the healthcare professional side, and especially also from the patient side, but also especially patients who have experience in the medicines development um, methodologies and technologies to be, uh, and who are therefore really able to, uh, to provide very meaningful advice and, and uh, opinions uh, to help us, you, um, applicants, so to say, of the system uh, to come up with good solutions. And uh, so, uh, all of you here in the panel are in the one or other way also, or in several ways, uh, involved in these discussions and uh, trying to find the right balance. So um, what we want to discuss now is how, pharma, uh, how blockchain and especially enabled through our pharma ledger project will be able to, um, to help with that situation and to make blockchain um, a reliable, safe, very well-known um, approach to handling data, personal data, um, in a more sophisticated way that enables the optimal use of these data for the generation of new treatments. Now, I think we cannot get into any discussion with everybody at the moment without thinking about COVID and um, the COVID pandemic and the situation in which we were all thrown since a year and all the changes and, and uh, new situations that we have been exposed to. Um, this was on one hand um, not so easy uh, for the Pharma Ledger project because we could not meet anymore in the way as we wanted to, um, but nevertheless this project and the team here was extremely active to nevertheless um, develop all the deliverables in an IMI project that were promised to be delivered uh, based, uh, according to the timelines. So we do the work that needs to be done despite, but um, there is quite often the discussion, okay, if we had been five years further and Pharma Ledger would have been already um, completed and everything would have been established and up and running, um, some of the situations would have looked differently than they were now in this crazy year 2020, we were surprised by everything. So my first question to the panel is, um, what do you think if we were really five years or seven years further and blockchain would have been really already established in the way we foresee it and envision it in Pharma Ledger, what would have been different um, in, in this pandemic and uh, this uh, period and this, let's say, a, a time of, of unexpected problems and hurdles um, and difficulties? So who wants to start? Hernando, would you like to? Sure. So thank you, Ingrid. Um, and, I, and I think it's important also for us to recognize that short of a world war, right, a pandemic has now become the other catalyst for, for tremendous change. Yeah, we've all been thrust now into uh, from the business side and from the personal side. I mean, normally we would all be together up on a stage talking, but yet here we are virtually working because this pandemic has really put us into a different, different precarious, challenging situations. Um, and I think what it's done for our business and for our processes as a whole, it's really pushed change to a level that we normally don't see. Right? So if I bring you to the world where I work, um, from the medical side, telemedicine has now become the normal, right? That is the thing. If you want to see a doctor, if you want to see a specialist, the, the, uh, the use of 
telemedicine, right, through a mobile device and uh, reaching out to a patient at their home has become the standard now, right? And I'm sure that's going to snap back and we'll go back to some sense of what the world was before this pandemic. But also from a trial side, from a clinical trial side, we now need to bring the trial to the patient, right? It's no longer a norm or should it be expected that the patient gets in their car, drives a couple of kilometers, has their procedures and goes back home. We've now had to revamp all those models. So one of the things that we're looking to do with the work at, at Pharma Ledger is also advance some of those technologies. And, and I say that from the perspective of we went into this thinking we're going to do some good work and do some great research, but the pandemic then happened. And now we've been forced to do it at a faster pace. And now the work that we're doing here has weight, right? It has relevance because it's no longer something that you're going to put on a shelf and research and be able to go back to and read it. But now we're going to be able to take some of these solutions and move them forward. And that's exciting. That's exciting for many different reasons. One of which is what I mentioned earlier, the ability of patients to connect with their data. Yeah? The ability for healthcare to actually be more focused, patient-centric, right? And also for patients to understand that their data is safe, right? Their data now has a better um, guarantee, if I will, and I'll let Nadat speak more to that later on, a little more assurance that the data is actually safer and being used wisely. And if, if not, then they can remove their, their use of this data in their healthcare systems. But I think it's an important aspect also to recognize. Absolutely. Nina, do you want to add? Yes, I, I completely agree with Hernanda. that there is a lot of potential that, uh, that could have been addressed uh, had we had blockchain broadly adopted uh, before the pandemic. And since we're talking about privacy, I think it's important to recognize one important lesson that we've learned uh, from the pandemic in, in that context. And that is that we don't trust uh, the tech companies or our governments, for example, to use and store our personal data, especially if, it, if we're talking about sensitive information like, like health, health data or, or, or geolocation data. And here I'm referring to the um, contract tracing apps, um, which were, which have, I would say had sort of a mixed success worldwide. Uh, you will remember they were introduced as a, as a promising way to control the spread of the disease by tracking our movements and, and, and exposure. And, but yeah, we didn't see them playing a, playing a big role in controlling the disease uh, because people weren't persuaded that those who were collecting or designing these apps were actually safeguarding the privacy despite the numerous pledges that we had uh, coming from all sides that they offer anonymity and, and the data are essentially stored on the, on the user devices. Um, if we take, for example, the EU and the US, um, I would say that contact tracing apps may have had been more successful in the EU. And, and I don't have statistical insights on this, so I may be speculating, but from all the interactions and connections that I've had from the people here in Europe, uh, most of them, or quite a few of them were using these, were using these apps. And, and, and all of these apps, the national contact tracing apps, underwent the scrutiny of the, of the national data protection authorities, which are the, the watchdogs of, um, of, of the GDPR, this comprehensive piece of of uh, data protection law that we have that we have in the EU, which sets up sort of a bulwark, I would say, against um, the misuse of information. Um, so this could have been one factor for the wider use of these apps in Europe and, and in the US. And Hernando may 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 say if I'm wrong here or not, uh, but there is no baseline privacy, federal privacy law establishing enforceable privacy rules. And, and studies, I've read studies that have shown that these contact tracing apps were a major failure primarily because of privacy concerns, which were listed as the key reasons, the key reason, or although not the only one, uh, I would say if we're not using these apps. Um, and to your question, Ingrid, would things have been different had we had already established blockchain-based contact tracing apps? Um, perhaps, I don't know. I mean, the technology does offer um, or allow for, for sharing of information while preserving the privacy of the users and users can specifically choose which data uh, that are significant for coronavirus relief efforts to share uh, while ensuring that their privacy and identity remain, remain protected. Uh, but I think everyone will agree here that trust isn't something that we can, we can build overnight. And uh, definitely we can't expect from blockchain to solve all our, all our problems. Um, and transparency is an important um, component in building this trust. And I would say uh, enabling transparency of information is one of the biggest promises of blockchain which provides a fully auditable um, and valid ledger of transactions. And, and this adds sort of a um, degree of accountability that may not have um, existed before. 
Yeah, um, I think one of the clear disadvantages of the apps was um, that we are here in Europe in different countries and uh, the apps in the different countries do not speak to each other, uh, but the people are moving between different countries. And uh, I think that made things also quite difficult to, to be efficient. Um, so I think um, it's uh, also something which is probably interesting or important for Katrin to when we talk about standardization and systems talking to each other, how relevant would you think um, is, is it that this works really in, in the when we want to really progress blockchain in a meaningful way? You are on mute. Uh, indeed, uh, thank you very much for this question. This is extremely important to see the value of data. And, and looking back in the previous question about what would happen if we were five years advanced, I think we would have a more uh, elaborate trust ecosystem. And, and there is a point here that, that, um, that I think we need to understand about the trust ecosystem and blockchain and its role is the fact that now the people involved invest a huge amount of time in data curation and preparation. And that's because in part, they don't trust the data. Yeah. And they in quote own the data because it's data that they created. So if we establish this ecosystem where there is a level playing field and where data are curated automatically because there are standards and because these standards are well adopted, uh, think, for instance, HL7 fire. Think, for instance, uh, the International Patient Summary for extracts of uh, electronic health uh, records that are meaningful. Then we would be at a different stage. We're building bridges between public health and care, which is very much relevant in the COVID era, would be easier. It would be easier because there would be established standards that we can and use without much effort and without thinking essentially. This is my aspiration for five years ahead. How blockchain fits in that space? Well, I mean, think of uh, Pharma Ledger and the off, um, of the chain storage of, uh, of, of data. You would reconstruct the health data in a standard form automatically. This is the vision five years ahead. And this is how we, uh, we can envision a, a new space where there is higher data literacy, there is higher data quality, and data is well formed by design. Very good. Yeah, Anka, would you want to comment as well? Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I feel like we're living in a very exciting time because we have a convergence of different elements that make uh, blockchain a very interesting topic today. We have uh, big players uh, sitting at the same table, finally working together on the blockchain project. And this is something that's uh, pushed by Pharma Ledger and all the people that are in this consortium. We also have investments because for a very long time, there were... Um, startups working on different projects. We had the ICO uh, period and then funds were kind of lacking and blockchain projects were remaining at experimentation status and not evolving very much. But now we have both the players and the investments. And the third element that I feel like it's really important and this was brought by the pandemic is the public awareness about the sensitivity of personal data and health data which I feel like it wasn't really a topic before the pandemic. Some people were aware of the fact that, uh, you know, there were breaches in hospitals and their health data is valuable and that they shouldn't expose it everywhere. But some people were not. And with the pandemic and the whole uh, discussion around contact tracing that you were mentioning, people began to understand the value of their health data and how much it can bring, whether it is for a medical research, um, but also to improve access to care and improve the healthcare pathway. So we have these three elements coming together and blockchain is here to sort of link all these things together and have a technological solution to the problem of data, um, of securing healthcare data. Um, but I feel like the technology can also can only solve the technical aspects of the problem. And there are a lot of different aspects to healthcare 
data privacy that cannot be addressed by the technology. And I think we have to be mindful of that, that the technology can solve the technical part, but then there's a lot of question about education. How, um, how do you help patients understand uh, the value of their data? How do you educate them to protect their own data? Uh, there are also questions about um, access to data and quality data which is not something that the technology can help with. And there's also discussions about the security of data because, because we have blockchain, it doesn't mean that we have to forget about all the security measures. And I feel like it's important to say that blockchain is here to bring more transparency and ensure the integrity of the information. But there are a lot of different considerations that we also have to keep in mind to build a, a whole solution that will address the big issue of data privacy. I couldn't agree more with you. I think we are riding at the moment at a, on, a way, on a wave of public interest that we were always dreaming uh, from uh, concerning uh, our activities uh, to, to inform the public about uh, the way how new treatments are developed. And there was absolutely no interest. Only when patients became sick um, or somebody in the family became sick, they start, some started to have a, a certain level of interest. But in one of the projects that EFGCP was very much involved in, this was the UPATI, the European Patients Academy on Therapeutic Innovation. That was also an IMI project where we developed in a standard, in a, in a, in a structured way, uh, capacity building of uh, educated patients. And um, we, as, at the beginning of this project, we did the biggest survey in, in Europe on interest of patients and knowledge of patients about the medicines development process. And what we found was really depressing, depressing because uh, not even 10% of the population had, this light, had even heard or was even thinking about where their medicines came from. And only three or 4% said that, yes, they have a relatively good idea how the medicines development process works. Nowadays, I get daily phone calls from everywhere, friends and family, everybody around. How does it work with these vaccines? And why is it not that, etc.? So we have a huge interest gain at the moment, and we should really, really also in Pharma Ledger benefit from that. But mentioning Pharma Ledger, I think uh, the fact that this is an IMI project, a multi-stakeholder IMI project, we are not only working here on the, on the technology and harmonizing the technology, but also uh, to provide, uh, to generate and work out the, the governance infrastructure. The, the societal infrastructure, the ethical infrastructure uh, for an optimal use of, of blockchain. And that leads me very well, I think, to a first question that we have received here. How do we ensure uh, to establish global rules to comply with in terms of data privacy independently from the technology used? Does one of you want to start? Answering that question, what can we do to ensure that we establish global rules to comply with in terms of data privacy? I, I think I, I, I can start a little bit. So I, I, again, and this is my, my viewpoint of the world. Um, one of the things that we're doing within the Ledger project itself is we're actually, there's a dedicated work stream aimed at reaching out to a lot of the regulatory, global regulatory bodies, right? So FDA, EMA, PMDA, um, EDB, uh, EDC, all these different organizations around the world to explain to them what we're doing and to try to get their uh, buy-in, but also feedback on the work that we're doing. Now, that's not necessarily going to build standards, but I think it's raising awareness that there is work being done here that could help and advance healthcare, right? So I think that's one step in the right direction. To me, this particular work, this body of work with Pharma Ledger is, is, is unique and different in that sense. We're really making a very concerted effort to make sure that the work we're doing Again, back to my earlier point, it's got weight. We're now taking this forward and actually having those conversations, those, dare I say, those intelligent conversations with the people that, that really can control and influence the way we move our projects forward. Yeah. And I think it's also really helpful that we have these use cases with these practical examples where we can pilot uh, concretely um, how, how it can work and what the issues are, um, because it's, it's always very difficult for people to, to stay in the purely theoretical environment. I think as soon as we can come with concrete um, examples, um, 
results, uh, data, then it becomes much more understandable and also tangible for, for people uh, to, to, to think about it and to, to uh, open their mind uh, to it and perhaps even enable the, the use of it. And also, okay. if I can build on yeah. that, um, I was recently reading this study that was conducted in a hospital and uh, patients were asked under which conditions they would share their personal health data. And one of the patients answered, well, I, I don't care about data sharing. I just want better care. And I feel like this reflects mm -hmm. the fact that patient today um, and just individuals in general in the society want a service or a product. And if giving up their health data to get that service or product is worth it, they will give up their health data. This is why we all you know, send messages on uh, social media and post photos because what we gain from it is much higher than the price of you know, giving up our health data or personal data. And I feel like th there's a balance there between knowing the value of your data and knowing what this data can help you uh, achieve. And then also what is given to you in exchange of this data. And if you get better care, if you get access to uh, drugs faster, for instance, in rare diseases and things like that, people will be willing to share their data. And then it, it is down to people that work in healthcare to make sure that when patients give up their data for that better service, the way that they give up their data is a safe and protected and secure way because they will give it up because of the better service. And it's our job to make sure that they do it in the good conditions. Yeah, I think I, Anka, I, you have um, certainly a, a, a very uh, important uh, point here. Um, your spontaneous reaction to say, we want better, uh, I, I'm happy to give my data, I want better care. Um, I could imagine some countries very easily where this answer came from, but I can also imagine some countries where we would need to look quite intensively for somebody who would react like that. Um, mm -hmm. Being a German living in Belgium, I can tell you, I, I think I would really have a hard time in Germany to, to find broadly such an answer because people in Germany are extremely concerned about their data privacy and protection and uh, everything that can be done, should be done, must be done under all circumstances. Um, I mean, I, there, there, are, there are examples where I was really completely astonished. Um, they, are, they are trying in Germany to, uh, to come to um, a common approach on getting uh, children back to school. And uh, one of the, the um, measures is that the children get twice per week uh, tested, uh, self-test or do a self-test. And there are uh, in some regions in Germany, parents who are not allowing or who do not want that their children are supervised by teachers when they do the self-test in, uh, in school hmm. and not in the private environment. So they do not get this measure through in Germany at the moment because of that discussion, because the outcome might be yes or no. And that is not something that the parents absolutely would want to share with the rest of the class. So I think coming back to, uh, to the, the question on the global rules. Um, so, so far, I think the, the answer, your answer was, um, if we demonstrate that it works and what the benefit is, then there will be a trust increase and um, there will be less hesitations. Um, but is there something that we can also do here to, uh, to really proactively come to a more joint agreement on what data privacy really means, what is relevant uh, to, to share and what not? Because when we think about um, all type of data, I mean, all type of data versus uh, health data. Um, and uh, let's say the, 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 the vulnerability that people feel when it is about their health data. I mean, people are very generous about their data. They, they have the names of their babies on the car, et cetera. So there are lots of uh, things that people are not uh, yeah, worried about sharing, but health data is particularly sensitive. So um, any idea and perhaps um, Katrin, from your global perspective, is there anything yeah. that could be done here? So um, a couple of points uh, were inspired by, by, by your insights. The first one is that we are living at uh, a time of a profound cultural shift. And this is partly due to the pandemic. So sometimes rules and regulations underpin this cultural shift. And you are right that there are differences in different countries. 
So the rules will not come at the same speed, but there is a general trend that we can identify. However, the most important element is something I, I referred to earlier, which is trust, building this trust ecosystem. And that's where blockchain and the work of pharma ledger across different lines is extremely important. Um, but there are more, there are more elements that contribute to this culture shift. I would like to mention, uh, for instance, the work we do in a project called Fair for Health, where we are trying to index health data that are private. They are about care. They are in a healthcare institution. And we would like to use them for research. So how do we make sure that we send the algorithm to the data rather than um, sending the data to the algorithm? And how do we make that in a way that protects the privacy of the individuals? So that's point one. And, and there, the whole movement of fair data, findable, accessible, and interoperable, and reusable is, is, uh, is, is out, uh, you know, it, it's extremely important. So think that uh, right now libraries, uh, research libraries are thinking how to index not only books, but also health data sets. And then what kind of metadata do you use to actually index those data sets so that the data are of adequate quality and they are good for purpose? So there is a duality here. There is a duality of my data versus the data of us, the community that can be used to be, uh, solve problems. And without bothering you, I would like to add a third element and that element has to do with mixing data that are public and open with data that are private. So think, for example, um, when you are trying to com uh, combine data about COVID in general, yeah, and uh, versus my movement, my health data, and, and the whole discussion about uh, uh, digital passports, digital health passports, which has uh, received so much pushback. So there is a value there, which we are not able to, um, to capture because we are not ready for it. But this is happening, it's, it's happening. And I think uh, use cases that, like the use cases of Pharma Ledger uh, would, would help to make this shift, uh, accelerate this shift. And of course, COVID is, is a key player. Yeah. Too, many, too many things, uh, too many ideas. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, Nenad, would you like to, to add here when you think yes. about the global rules? Yeah, when we talk about privacy around health data, I would say we have to make a distinction whether we're talking about health information created by the healthcare um, professionals like electronic medical records, uh, lab tests, prescription, whatever, or health information which is generated by the patients uh, themselves using mm. apps, wearables, tracking devices, which can not only reveal aspects of their physical or mental health, but also their exact location at a certain point in time, or their social behavior or interaction, as we're seeing that, that more and more studies are showing that um, health stats plus social connections combined offer a stronger picture of the patient's overall health than, than either data set alone. So, so I would say that are rather increased privacy concerns around this second group of user-generated um, health-related data coming from the mobile devices and, and consumer health apps as they're built outside the recognized medical and clinical settings. Uh, and, and therefore, they're avoiding essentially the heavy regulations um, and rules that would otherwise apply had they been, um, impl had they been intended to be used in, in, in the healthcare sector. And, and one important conclusion perhaps that we can draw from, from this growing market of mobile apps, um, health apps, is that Patients and consumers, and this goes uh, to, to, to Anka's uh, point, um, want, at the end of the day, want to be better informed about their health. So we have to think about how we can bring this first group of, of data that sits in silos, in hospitals, uh, in pharmacies, research organizations, closer to the patients so that we can draw conclusions and be better informed about our health and be, uh, be involved in the in our treatments, uh, and and this is what we're doing. We're essentially trying to do um, in pharma ledger as well, setting up 
Yeah, I think that is um, you. You raised a number of, of uh, very important points that uh, that would really need to be be further discussed in detail. Um, but um, I think one uh, point that we have not yet discussed, but that which you raised, is um, the difference of of the data. There are data that patients share proactively and voluntarily because they are convinced or have understood that if they share this type of information, then that may be helpful for them or the the, the whole system uh, to generate uh, something important new for them. I think the the big fear is for uh, about the the hidden data, the data generated by apps, for example, understanding where people are at the moment, uh, walking, living, uh, what they are looking at. Um, and, and so these indirect data that are generated through our uh, IT systems and that are not fully under the control of the patient um, and where there are people more or less um, suspicious of in how far their ownership rights are respected. So um, could we could we help the system or the, the, the development or the acceptance um, in by by finding a solution through blockchain that makes it more transparent, clearer, and therefore can build more trust about what happens with these indirect data that are not under the direct control by the person, but where others are using the data in a sophisticated way to come up with a type of, um, uh, of information that is, of course, also important, but um, the, the individual person, the patient, cannot in any way decide whether this is important or not, no? but they, it, it's given it's gone and it's out of their control so yeah. can uh, blockchain help here to bring us back to our topic so, so Ingrid, let me let me just yeah i want to advance this but i also want to come back and make a make a point about something everybody has touched upon and that's the the level of um data literacy that we have right the lack thereof and so i'll, I'll give you an example anka spoke about the the patient's wants and desires to just get better treatment do you think they would feel the same if they knew what their data is being used for or how their data is being, how much money is being made on their data, right? And this is just from the app side. So on a, on a personal side, my friends and family have no idea what happens to their data when they like, when they go on social media, when they're doing all these things. That data is monetized and it's being used against them to build more apps to separate them further from their money, yeah? Mm -hmm. On the healthcare side, I'm collecting data and I'm so heavily regulated that I can't even move to, to Catherine's point. I can't bring the algorithm to the data, right? So we play by different rules. If patients knew that the data we're using is being used to develop life-saving, right? Or, or life-improving therapies and drugs, that would be a different story, but it's not. We get lumped into one big bucket, right? Mm -hmm. They're using that pharma company using my data and God knows what they're doing with it. And they're just like Google and we're not. Yeah. Very different, yeah? Um, where I think Pharma Ledger is different, unfortunately, we're still being looked in the same way is we're now looking at data differently. We are yet still heavily regulated, but also now have more security and more provenance for the data, right? So patients inside the work that we do at Pharma Ledger have connection to the data now, and we can guarantee it, right? Something that you normally can't do, but we can tell you what's happening to your data, and if you want your data back or don't want to share your data, you can do that. We can now assure you that once you say you want to be forgotten from one of our use cases or trials, it can happen now, right? Google can't tell you that. Facebook can't tell you that. But we're viewed in the same light. So one of the key aspects for us is data literacy, right? And, and that whole sense of how the data is being used. So in our use cases, we speak specifically to, to educate patients on how the data is being used and how blockchain, specifically this use of technology, can really advance this space for us and try to separate us a little bit from the normal world where data is monetized and, and your likes become the next stat that you see. Yeah. Yeah. Katrin? And, and uh, this brings uh, back uh, one specific uh, case, uh, use case uh, that Pharma Ledger is actually sharing with another project I'm involved in, Gravitated Health, which is uh, the leaflets, the uh, medicines leaflets. And this is a, a topic that is very close to, uh, to our behavior. Huh? So I always had this dream that I would go into a pharmacy, I would have my medication list and my problem list and my allergies on my mobile, and they would help me decide which over-the-counter medicine I would choose because it would be safer. 
So think not only in general terms of, about data literacy, but also about medicines literacy, how it can be boosted if we move to the space where we can use productively data that are private, my data, my health data, my problem list, my allergies, my medication list, but also public data like the leaflet information and how we can develop the trust that is necessary to trust the information about the leaflets. Huh? Yeah. That's where blockchain can make a difference. It really make a difference. Um, I see here a question, how can we differentiate between critical, for example, medical history and non-critical information, for example, the blood group? Um, can we, do we need in, with blockchain, uh, have to make a, a differentiation or is there a need that we are not fulfilling yet? How to, to deal with that critical or non-critical data? Uh, if I may say something on that, yeah. I think the, the key point is how you use the data, the use case. I mean, you can use a knife to cut a throat or you can use a knife to prepare your food, right? Mm. It's the same thing with data. Yeah. Okay, and, but I think it's also a bit of, of personal um, judgment on one hand, um, because for example, when we think about blood groups, if somebody is uh, rhesus negative, um, that is per se already more difficult to live with than if you are um, a, a, blood, a blood group zero, which uh, a large portion of the population has. So if anything happens to you, you have a much better chance to get blood um, from, from somebody else than if you have a rare um, blood group. So I think also here uh, we have to still differentiate in how far people feel vulnerable. Uh, because of the of the health data uh, or the data that they are sharing. And also here we have differences. What is important for people and what is not important for people? So I think it's really, really um, a difficulty that we in, in the future probably will have to work uh, more sophisticatedly on figuring out how that can be uh, more generalized and then to develop information, improve the data and health literacy uh, to make people aware where it's really critical and why and where it's not really critical. Um, so um, Catherine, there was a question to you, Catherine, how can an algorithm come to the data? Uh, I think I think this is a I, I, I threw a very a black and a black statement. Uh, there is a technique, there is technology that you can do, but uh, then you open a whole other set of questions like what kind of algorithms I would allow to run on my data. Uh, in general terms, there is a research area which is called uh, privacy preserving machine learning. So where you are actually allowing machine learning algorithms, even in the distributed environment to run um, and, and break out results, preserving the, um, the anonymity of the data uh, that arrive because you get only the result. For example, um, you know, typical, um, uh, typical uh, levels uh, uh, of a disease or, you select uh, different questions like, for instance, in, in Fair for Health, one question that we are trying to answer is uh, 30 day readmission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one way to solve this question is to send the data about admissions from a hospital to a central place, along with data from other hospitals and answer the question. The other way is to say, give me the 30 day readmission rate and make sure that the data are in a shape that they can answer this question in the same way in Spain and in Italy and in Switzerland. That's one of the things that we are addressing in, uh, in the project called Fair for Health uh, by verifying data. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further comments on that? I think when we had a conversation earlier in this group, uh, Anka brought up an interesting point to the Catherine's about the tokenization, right? So the tokenization of patient data, this very new, very different approach of how data is used is possibly an example of how the algorithm is brought to data, right? So the data stays within the, the native systems, but you're applying this technology that allows the data to be followed through its journey. And then in this case, the use of blockchain and tokenization allows the patient to say, look, I'm done. 
I don't want this. Or I don't want health records maintained. I want my data back. Or in some cases, I want to make money off my data, right, Anka? So they can literally now have more control of their data. And that's an example of where we're now applying. Let the data sit where it sits. We'll bring the algorithm to it. That's new. That's not necessarily part of Pharma Ledger, but I could easily see that that could become the next right point of um, point of interest. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And uh, one of the things that we talked about when we had this conversation was uh, tokenization of the data and um, having the data uh, in a digital format be an NFT and uh, just have this idea that uh, just as you own a, a token, you can own your data. And I think that this is um, another conversation that uh, is brought by blockchain is the fact that um, we sometimes say that with blockchain, people will be able to own their data. Um, but I don't know if there's such a thing as owning your data. Um, first of all, from a regulatory perspective, I don't think that there's a lot of places where this is just not possible. In France, um, your data is like your kidney. You cannot own it. It's part of your body, but you cannot own it. Therefore, you cannot monetize it. But I know it's different in different places in the world. So I think we have to be careful with um, the words that we use because blockchain can give you more control over your data, uh, bring more transparency, ensure the integrity of your data. But I don't think that you can go as far as to say that blockchain and tokens will give you ownership of your data. Of your data. Okay. Yeah. I think you the the key point that we that we seem to to need to um, achieve is an improved trust level um, in the in the in the handling of, of data in general. I mean, this is it's a um, uh, it's a huge general topic, a highly political topic uh, in, in Europe. We have the GDPR after many years of uh, of discussions, and uh, still there is the 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 big concern that um, there are commercial organizations who are able to uh, to collect a lot of information without control of, of the, the the generators of uh, of these data on one hand and to um, yeah to draw conclusions from this huge amount of data um, that people would not want them to draw but um, that they would want to see perhaps in a, in a public environment uh, develop and not in a commercial environment so um, what would you think is um, the uh, the possibility or what are the options here really um, and what should we communicate as a simple message uh, to the public in how far blockchain can really in, um, improve their trust level uh, that uh, by by agreeing to it we're using it um, they they can really improve the situation for themselves and for the the public at large if i can share my view from 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 the pharma ledger perspective uh, here um, in Pharma Ledger, we've created this uh, this vision of open data sharing units uh, with the with the main idea to have our data assets securely encrypted off Ledger and only anchor it with a with a cryptographic reference in the in the root blockchain to inherit its properties. And the vision with Open DSU is that the users, the patients, are in control of their confidential data via uh, smart or digital wallets, where we can manage data access and give consent. Um, to data processes for the confidential data stored in these in, in our smartphones, and, and this way we're utilizing the characteristics of um, of blockchain to address the aspects, as as you mentioned, Ingrid, that are essential to increase trust in the system. So we're basically having our digital identity stored in our digital wallets, which collect and protect our biological, medical, whatever data throughout the day, and we decide how we want to use any of this data as we're the sole owners of the encryption keys that can decrypt the information for, for selected parties. So all these pieces of information in our digital wallets come in the form of, of verifiable credentials um, that are cryptographically shared between peers, peers in the edges of the network. So this way we can we can be in control of our of our of our personal information, not only not only health data. Okay, yeah, so I think um, I, I fully agree with you. The, the question is how can we convey that message um, to, to the public to make this really as a part of, of the public current, um, yeah, general understanding um, because um, I mean, fears come always from feeling not knowing enough, not being, uh, uh, being exposed to a situation that is not fully transparent. So managing the fears by providing information that is 
relevant, correct, and understandable, easily understandable. Is uh, these are probably elements that um, are most suitable to to reduce fears. I know that we have not much time left, but I would like to go to a question that uh, we have received from the audience. Um, there is the question is, which is the vision of Pharma Ledger with blockchain? Imagine you are in year 2030, how the panel C will happen when a patient arrives at a hospital. What have been the advantages for a patient with the implementation of black blockchain in comparison with today? So what will, what will be available uh, in the hospital and uh, how will the data be used in comparison to today? Does it mean in, in simple things that they have to do le uh, less tests because the test results from everybody from, from the whole last 10 years are now available and trends are clear or what will be the advantages? I can share with you a vision that may or may not include Pharma Ledger. I hope it does, but I can share with you uh, in 2030, what I would love to do is to be able to go to my doctor with my phone and provide my medical records and give my consent through my phone, get in my car, go down the street and vote with my phone uh, via, via blockchain voting, then go to the airport, show my vaccination records and get on the plane with my phone, and then also pay for said airplane and travel with my phone through Bitcoin, um, and then go to my final destination and order my room and do everything with my phone through the the advancements of, of uh, blockchain. So is that pharma ledge? Of course not, not all that is, a portion that is. But I think we're starting to get to the point where we have create, we can create a level of trust. Patients can trust from the perspective of pharma. Patients can trust that their data is being safely stored and no longer used in malicious or malintent ways. I think for us, that's one of the best outcomes that pharma ledge can produce. Okay, any other answer for one of you? I, I would like to say also to answer to another question that was mentioned in relation to this vision of 2030. It was, uh, the question was about uh, ownership of data and the question whether we really can own our data. And I think Anka referred to the answer to that. But what I would like to add is that uh, the key is linked data. How do we connect the data? And where Pharma Ledger can connect uh, the dots link the different kinds of data and bring the patient, the person at the center of their health related data is uh, the place where uh, efforts like Pharma Ledger can make a difference. Uh, I can connect the dots and then I can go as Hernando said to my doctor and say, here are my data from five, 10 different hospitals. Can you run an algorithm to tell me what are my prospects given my recent exams? What are my risks? Hmm? Mm -hmm. What is the best treatment for me? Can I enroll in an advanced treatment and clinical trial? These kinds of questions we cannot answer today, but I hope with a trust ecosystem that allow us to link safely data from different sources, we can make this happen. Okay, very good. I mean, one thing that um, is really also the basis here for everything is um, the identity of the person. Uh, we have this in, in clinical trials um, as, a, as a, a big important point, for example, when we do um, virtual informed consent, which is something um, that, that is uh, getting more and more frequent, especially in Corona times, the contact between the physician and the patient um, need to be reduced to the bare minimum. So the information about the clinical trial can be done uh, virtually. The question is, we need a signature from the patient that he has been properly informed and, and consents to participation, how can we ensure that this person who gives the consent is really the person that afterwards will then also participate in the trial. So I think here we have a couple of, and I see now that we are getting interrupted soon in our discussion, um, but I think that is uh, what I would like to use then also here as the last uh, point. So to say that uh, there are still lots of details that we have to define uh, where we need to find uh, pragmatic solutions, easy to understand solutions um, that uh, can help then ultimately uh, to, to raise the data um, literacy and the awareness of the benefits of sharing data in a certain way, in a controlled way, um, and to trust in blockchain technology. 
So with this, I think uh, I would like to thank you very much for a very lively discussion. Thank you to the audience uh, for your very interesting questions. Um, and I think we are only at the start of this discussion, not only this afternoon, there will be many more discussions about that, but also generally uh, when we want to be sure that blockchain gets introduced into our daily life in a, in a very comprehensive and intense way uh, to make our life in 2030 better than it is today. So thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon and evening. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for, for preparing this Beautiful panel with Nana, Hernando, Catherine, Anka. Thank you so much for being to here today. And thank you to the audience. Uh, it's been a very active chat. Thank you for that. Just uh, to let them know, we will have the following session in 20, 30 seconds. So those who want to be as engaged as now in the chat, you just need to go to the schedule and click on the, on the next session. And then we'll keep the conversation there. Thank you so much once again, and thank you to Pharma Ledger also for organizing the all those uh, pharma related sessions that uh, bring so much value to the discussion. See you in a bit. Thank you very much.